we're in marketing. And so we should know better than anybody else that you always start with audience, right? Yeah. yeah. You have to start out with a, with an objective. Uh, you have to, the audience has needs. Those needs can be translated into features in a product. Those features can be re, uh, translated into requirements. Those requirements are then put into sprints. Those sprints are then put into epics and then you have releases and there's like so many things that have to happen uh, in order for you to develop a tool. Now, certainly you don't just have an idea and then just um, go through that crazy process of, thinking about audience and doing interviews and all that stuff. Um, you might like test a couple of things out, but like once you get a hint for like, this is a thing, mm -hmm. that's when you like do those, you get all the stakeholders in the room and uh, you just make it happen. And all right. We are recording. Today I have on Ethan Lyon. He's here to talk about data engineering, some of the skills you need to get into it, and how you can apply it to other career fields. So Ethan, thank you for coming on. Of course, man. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm excited for this one. Uh, data engineering is an interesting field, and you've applied it to a lot of stuff I'm really interested in from a selfish point of view with uh, <laughs> pay-per-click advertising and, and using data engineering to enhance the performance of those campaigns. So we're going to get into that uh, and talk about how you get in this career field. But first, Ethan's kind of an expert on how to apply skills to get uh, jobs and to basically create value for people in really creative ways. So before this, you were saying, Ethan, that, you know, nowadays you can have a PhD and be basically jobless. Like you need to be able to learn skills that are in demand. So how did you come to that conclusion? Can you talk a little about your background? Because I know that. Uh, has little to do with it and uh, what, what skills do you think are important for people these days? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think now is such an amazing time to be alive and to empower yourself to do amazing things, right? Mm -hmm. um, we have so many online education platforms that you can, you know, if you want to learn JavaScript, you can, if you want to learn, and a lot of it's like techno uh, technology focused, yeah. but uh, you know, we were, we built a monolithic app um, and what that means is, you know, we had one uh, application that um, essentially we're like, oh, we want to get, P let's say it was PPC data, right? Yeah. Uh, this one application only had PPC data and uh, we wanted other applications to consume it. Mm -hmm. And it was, and we had all these requests coming from around the organization. It was like, oh no. And it is like very, very, very overwhelming. Yeah. And it was like, oh my gosh, like we're doing software development. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, light bulb goes off. So then I just went on online and was like, well, what does a development team look like? And so yeah. just by Googling stuff, because we have, you know, uh, there's maybe three developers in a company of 200 people at SEER. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the only one that's, I think, non-client focused. And, uh, and so just by like Googling stuff, you start figuring out like, oh, well, you know, there are different ways of managing developers. Like we had, we had some people, uh, some amazing folks over in India that were doing some of the coding for us. And I had no idea how to manage them. So I was like, well, how do you manage devs? And it's like, oh, this thing called Agile. Well, I've heard of Agile. And this thing called Scrum. And yeah. so I got product owner certified because I was like, oh, we're doing product. And so in, in taking a ton of courses on uh, Pluralsight, mm -hmm. um, because there's so many, because there's so much information out there, it's so empowering to know that you have any problem that you're going to come in contact with, someone else has a solution for and probably like a whole suite of courses to, yeah. uh, to take where you can educate yourself about it. So within the last year, we went from building like a monolithic system. I was a terrible manager. Um, I had no idea how to manage devs. And now like I'm a product owner, uh, we are doing uh, product visioning, um, we, we have, uh, I learned a lot about architecture um, and how to de develop the systems. And there's like so many cool things that we're doing that we didn't have a year ago. And that's only because uh, of online learning platforms. Um, wow. Dude, think about it like, like, think about in the eighties. If you want to learn programming, you got a yeah. book and it was like this big and it was like, yeah. learn C. It was like a Bible <laughs> and no one could read that. Like what were you supposed to do with it? Yeah. Uh, and now it's like, oh, um, I'm getting this one trace error on this Python script. You literally copy it, paste Google. it into, into Google, and then uh, someone has a solution. Yeah. And I'll tell you, having programmed for like maybe like four or five years, um, there have been very, very, very few instances where the error that I was getting, I could mm -hmm. not find a solution for it. Mm -hmm. So like, 
if you have the motivation, the desire to do it, like you can make it happen. Yeah. Um, this guy's you know, I, I do, you know, I've worked with people before where they're like, cause I have a little bit of a machine learning background. Um, and I've applied some machine learning stuff to the things uh, here at SEER. Um, I've had people come up to me and be like, teach me data science. <laughs> yeah. It's like, cool. So what do you want to know? Data science. And so yeah. it's, it, it's, it's like, that's not very helpful, right? Like, <laughs> no. um, I love, you have no idea how much I love working with people that are like, Hey man, I was trying to work on this Python script and I've been coming into this issue. I just keep on hitting the, the site and it keeps on crashing. Is there any way that I might be able to make this more efficient or I'm running this error and I've searched it and searched it and searched it. And I've spent like an hour. Is there any way that you can help me out with it? It's yeah. like, of yeah. course I will spend nights and weekends working with you to, to like push you forward. Yeah, um, that kind of like, like a man individual that's exhausted your resources. Yeah, exactly. Right? Because you can spend all day with people that just want to do stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, I'm, and I'm also not that great at like test taking. <laughs> so like formal education <laughs> yeah. is, you know. Not your forte. Man, I don't know. Like, so this is interesting. Just for some background, I uh, originally saw Ethan's work through an article he has. You can look it up. I'll link it. It's called The Non-Coder's Journey uh, into Data Engineering. And it's about how at the agency he works at, which is Sierra Interactive, is a uh, pay-per-click marketing agency. Is that correct? Yep. We also do creative and analytics and other stuff. But yeah, definitely okay, do pay. So kind of a lot of a full service digital marketing. Mm -hmm. So he works at an agency called Seer Interactive, and he, because of some of the issues they're having with data management, helped build a tool for the team, essentially decided he's gonna become a software engineer and built this uh, data engineering tool. So I originally came across him from this work, but now that we're talking, uh, it's clear that you, you almost became a, a product manager after you built this initial tool. Would that be correct? It sounds like you're managing a, the whole development team for Seer Interactive. Uh, not for Seer Interactive, I'm managing a couple of external devs. But uh, yeah, so it's, it's insane to think like we're in marketing, right? Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, well, I'll just like hack together this script. And then someone's like, oh, well, I want to use that. And the, but so you're like, oh, here you go. They're like what? I don't, I don't know what Python is. And they're like, oh, okay. So then how do I communicate with that person? Well, yeah. maybe I should have a website. Um, and then they're like, oh yeah, but can you add these like five buttons? And then they tell their friend and their <laughs> friend is like, Hey, could you add these five buttons? And at the end of the day, like, yeah, yeah, I could do it. I could do it. And then at the end of the day, you have this like Frankenstein of a tool that no one can use and is yeah. terrible yeah. pain. And you incurred all this technical debt, uh, that like, it just be, everyone stops using it. Cause then you start losing trust with them. And mm -hmm. it's like, we're in marketing. And so we should know better than anybody else that you always start with audience. Right. Yeah. yeah. You have to start out with a with an objective. Uh, you have to. The audience has needs. Those needs can be translated into features in a product. Those features can be re, uh, translated into requirements. Those requirements are then put into sprints. Those sprints are then put into epics, and then you have releases. And there's like so many things that have to happen uh, in order for you to develop a tool. Now, certainly, you don't just have an idea and then just um, go through that crazy process of thinking about audience and doing interviews and all that stuff. Um, you might like test a couple of things out, but like once you get a hint for like, this is a thing, mm -hmm. that's when you like do those, you get all the stakeholders in the room and uh, you just make it happen. And, um, and it's, it, it, it was so, I can't tell you like how frustrating it was and how uh, challenging it was to field all the questions internally about like how we're using the tools, how much does it cost, uh, budgeting, um, like all the product owner stuff that um, it comes with software development. And you're like, yeah. I don't know. Like you just have to figure it out, right? Because no one else is yeah, going to yeah. do it for you. Yeah. Um, try by fire. And, um, and so it's a, you know, working in a startup environment is absolutely amazing uh, because you do get that experience and you're given a lot of responsibility very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Some people respond really well to it. Some people don't. Um, I'm someone that just loves uh, – being given like a kind of an ambiguous challenge and uh, being really frustrated and bummed out for like six months and then like having an epiphany and then like, Oh my God, I'm doing software development. This is what you do. And then you just Google it and you're like, Oh wow. Now everything makes sense. And so we just, um, we're uh, building uh, a microservice right now and we're starting from the very beginning. And, we're doing it the right way. and it, I cannot tell you how nice it feels. It's yeah, like when you first, yeah, dude, it's like when you're first driving, right? Like when you when you first got behind a wheel, were you a little nervous? 
I think at that point I was like just super excited. Like by the time I was like, <laughs> driving on my own, I was just like really excited. Let's do this. You're like going 90 miles an hour. Your dad's yeah, that's in the car. He's like, oh, this is a parking lot. You can't go 90 miles an hour. Can't do that. Um, yeah, I think there's like a certain level of fear or anxiety and excitement. Like I agree with you. Like when you're starting on a new project, it is exciting because you're like, there's so much possibility. Um, yeah. There's all these other feelings and emotions that come along with it that like, you know, once you've done it over and over again, it just is like autopilot. Right, like now you get in a car, you start it up, you don't even think about like, well, do you know? I'm definitely turning right on right here. Am I allowed to do that? Like, you're like, yeah, I got this. And you just keep on going, right? So yeah, it sounds like it sounds like you got used to building things and, and software engineering pretty quickly. Um, I know that I know the specific one I, I was looking at was I think it was the it was some sort of pay per click internal like data management system for how you guys were, I know, using your pay-per-click data and then finding keywords. And you, you talk about in that article I read about engineering this tool for that. Was that your first real like big software engineering project? Yeah, so um, I started out in journalism. Uh, yeah, started out in journalism that. and then I was a, I got into SEO. I did door-to-door -door sales for a while, which is interesting. Um, yeah. It gives you a lot of humility. Uh, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, I was an SEO account manager. Uh, then I was a team lead. So I learned a lot about people management. Um, and then in, in, I was an innovation lead because I had a little scent of like how to program a little bit. Um, and so I'd created other projects when I was an innovation lead that involved coding, um, that I would say were pretty significant, uh, as like a, uh, an additional revenue source for the company. Um, but the problem is, is that like, it's cool to build something. It's not cool to maintain something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So like how many, how many like scripts have you had? Or how many Excel sheets do you have that were like little mini tools, but because you know, you don't use them every day, you stop maintaining them. They kind of fall by the wayside. So yeah. like, I'm really trying to make sure that the tools that we're developing, we're going to continue to develop even after I leave here. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, it was, it was probably the second major uh, programming project that I've been a part of. Um, and the, the purpose behind that is, you know, when we, you know, when you're doing paid, paid advertising, right? Like Google is very good at automating bids for you. Um, other tools are great at automating bids. Um, and so we had this uh, decking client, right? And this decking client, um, we've been with them for a really long time. And uh, the CEO was going through their paid data and he saw the word Disney. Mm. Like, like when you think of decking, like what, what's the first thing that comes to mind? You mean decking, like setting up decks, like about like long built, like porches, like decks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's uh, what they do. Yeah, probably like finishes, like probably keywords for like finishes or like the supplies to do it or like maybe, maybe permits, something like that. Or plans? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so it was interesting is that we, we were uh, showing up for a Disney deck plan. Disney um, plan. Okay. Yeah. And so you're like, that doesn't make any sense. I guess like a Mickey Mouse like themed deck. I don't know. But yeah. when we Googled it, it was like, oh, Disney has cruise lines. De cruise lines have decks and they have plans. So people were like, oh. we were wasting money on Disney deck plans when, um we didn't need to and there was this like kind of fear uncertainty and doubt and, like you know usually we catch that stuff but i mean there's a lot of long tail out there that you just don't have time to go through and, and like all the search query reports there's only so much time for you to go through and sift through all that data there's a lot in there oh yeah yeah so um what the task was was to leverage organic data um to identify where there are opportunities for uh removing waste and spend so like, how do we programmatically detect Disney is a bad keyword, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and we did that by, you know, combining it with organic data. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, the, the tool that we built uh, helps find ways to spend. And we just actually just got finished with um, figuring out the value to clients today. Um, you know, if you look at when we were first advertising on that search term, like Disney deck plans, let's say it was like two years ago. Mm -hmm. And you know, today when we turn it off, if you look at how much you spent during that time and divide it by the number of days, you then can figure out how much you were spending on that day. And you can multiply that by three years 
then you can be like, oh, so this oh, is wow. by preventing uh, a spending on these uh, keywords, you know, it's yeah. just how much money we're able to make clients. Yeah. And um, I think we only have, I think like maybe half our clients in the tool and it's uh, saved like an estimated like 1.6 million, I think. Oh, wow. That's wild. That's I mean, it's awesome. like pretty significant. Yeah. 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 Because I mean, the team is amazing too at like going in and being like, does this make sense? Should I negate this keyword? And uh, they've just done such a fantastic job of um, like combining the, the automated stuff mm. with the human element and knowing that client like very deeply. And when you combine those two, um, you get a very, very, very powerful um, system in place that then results in, uh, in save money. Um, no one is ever, like Google is never gonna tell you to stop spending money. Um, and a lot of places aren't going to tell you to stop spending money because they get a percentage of the revenue. Um, but I think that it's, it's hard to go to bed at night knowing that you're wasting a bunch of money for your clients. Right. Yeah. Uh, even if it results in you getting less money. And so that kind of aligns with our uh, ethos here. Um, yeah, I, that was a crazy tangent. I apologize. I'm definitely gonna go on tangents. I'm like one of those types no, of people. No, that's, yeah, yeah. It's, totally, it's totally fine. Like that's, cause it's interesting. I was thinking about it when you were saying it, trying to figure out what technologies, like are you, were you guys scrubbing like the AdWords search term reports with like Google Webmaster Tools search term reports for organic search queries, like that type of thing? Or how, what were you guys scrubbing? Like, what kind of data? I'm kind of curious. Um, so we use uh, organic ranking data. So uh, from a third party, not from um, Google. Okay. And, uh, just looking at uh, how that aligns with, um, you know, what we're spending on those PPC accounts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And th so there's like, you know, in doing that, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of overhead, right? There's a lot of, um, when you're talking about, you know, processing like hundreds of millions of rows of data, you know, every single day, uh, you need to build an infrastructure that will kind of support that, right? You can't do that in Excel. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess you could technically do it, but you couldn't do it at the scale. Um, and so it's really important to learn. Um, I, I didn't want to go into DevOps. So you could like spin up a Kubernetes cluster and do a pod and blah, 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 uh, manage all the computers. But Google, um, and I know Amazon is probably the same, uh, maybe even better, uh, at building out tools for you to manage all that data. And so um, I took a great Coursera course. If anyone's interested um, on learning Google Cloud Platform, I think Google probably does a better job than anybody else at like educating non-technical people on how to use their platform. Mm -hmm. um, Coursera has an amazing uh, specialization for GCP. And I just took that and then um, started building architecture diagrams uh, based on the needs of the tool and the team. Um, I'll tell you that like that engineering uh, couldn't happen until we figured out like all the people it wasn't for. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, no, I'm not going to put all this data into your Google Cloud plat platform, right? Like, no, I'm not going to give you a login uh, if you're not a member of Seer. Like, no, I'm not going to, because all of that re would require like different, you know, different technology, right? And so we were mm -hmm. just like, you know, this is for internal people only. This is um, for ad for PBC account managers. Just kept it super simple. Uh, they have a specific set of needs. Uh, they want to find ways to spend quickly. And then those needs are broken down into different features of the tool and requirements and uh, architecture and all that. So, mm -hmm. and like when you talk about Google Cloud Platform, was this a Google BigQuery you were using, or what? What uh, service was this? I tried to use like because I was I love uh, learning about new technology, um, yeah. and so I tried to use all of Google's technology. So when I first logged into Google Cloud Platform, I was so confused by all of the different options. Yeah, um, yeah. After after taking Coursera, um, I figured out like when you would use a NoSQL database versus a SQL database. Um, so like data store versus MySQL, um, figuring out when you would want to use a uh, big query, like an analytical database versus a transactional database, like data store, mm -hmm. um, figuring out like, uh, connecting different apps with uh, PubSub, which is a message queuing system. Um, so currently we use cloud functions. You can build really great, um, really great uh, HTTP services with cloud functions, PubSub, data store, big query. Um, we're now using Airflow uh, to orchestrate all of the data moving into all from all the different projects and applications. Mm -hmm. um, we're really trying to use um, all of Google's technology as it makes sense. 
Um, so BigQuery is like one small part of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, because you're just having tons of data move through the system. And let's say like one part of the system goes down, you want to be able to replay it. That's where Airflow and Composer come in. Yeah, I mean, for the non-technical person that doesn't know GCP, I just said a, a lot of stuff that didn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's like one of those things where, you know, when you take the course and kind of going back to our earlier point, like I didn't know, no one at SEER knows any of this stuff. Like I don't yeah. know anyone to talk to about this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I had to learn on my own and it's just through Coursera, Pluralsight, Udemy, all of those different services that, um, that you just kind of, be, yeah, familiarize yourself with it. And it's, you can go as deep as you want. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'm actually considering going back to school to get a, uh, computer science degree. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. That's dedication. I think I'm like, it's about time. Like it's, I, it's about time. So that's, that's really interesting. This Oh man, so many questions. This this interests me because on the one hand, uh, it seems like all these tools are becoming more accessible for people who are quote unquote non-technical, meaning like just you're not writing a lot of code. Right. There's a lot no more. Worries. And then on the other hand, it seems like it's becoming more and more, more, and more valuable every day to understand uh, at least a little bit of software engineering, especially for marketers. And if you can actually oh, yeah. use apps, like much more. Like if you're, if you're not just like understand some code, but you're actually like able to engineer like serious apps, it seems like it's tremendously valuable. So can you give an example, just so for people kind of know what we're talking about, um, like with an example that uh, something you can build for marketers that would be enhanced by having your own things like your own data warehouse and your own way to mix data and display it uh, compared to using out of the box tools, like maybe just like you know, Google Analytics and like the Facebook ads reports. Yeah, so uh, I'm glad that you brought that up because we just ran into a circumstance where um, I'll, I'll give a, a, a brief plug for do, two different tools or their competitors, but they have two different uses. Awesome. So as a marketer, you're like, oh, I want um, Google AdWords data. And, you know, we're a pretty large agency. And so um, Google has a service where you can literally take your entire MCC and then copy yeah. it into BigQuery, right? Yeah. Yeah. For us, we have too much data. And so it'd be way too expensive to do that. Okay. And so um, <clears throat> there are two tools that you should consider if you have a, you know, if you don't want to do that and you want to connect it to, let's say Bing or some other service, right? Uh, Pipedrive, we use Pipedrive for our uh, CRM. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Google doesn't offer those as uh, natively, right? And so you need to go with a uh, third party for provider. Um, Stitch is amazing. Um, if you have a, like a little, little amount of data, if you have a lot of tools, um, like you're using Salesforce maybe and um, uh, Google Analytics and Bing and Facebook, and you have all these different, and you're using Harvest for your time tracking, you have all these different places where you're uh, collecting data, but you don't have one central repository and you yeah. don't have a lot of data, um, Stitch is amazing. Where it gets expensive is when, you know, if, if you have a lot of data and you're funneling it through Stitch, that's when it gets a bit more pricey. And that's yeah. when you need to go over to a solution like Fivetran. So um, Fivetran, they do all of our, uh, they funnel all of our AdWords data into BigQuery. Um, okay. Yeah, because, I mean, dude, we have like hundreds of millions of rows of data. Uh, yeah. and that we, I mean, and it's and like we only want a small little slice. Like when you do the BigQuery transfer um, from AdWords into BigQuery, it gives you literally everything. It copies the entire thing. And so you're storing all that data, you're spending money on storage and yeah. query that you don't really need to. Yeah. Um, so I would recommend those two tools for marketers um, if you're not technical. Like it took me, I almost cried because. Um, <laughs> I almost cried because I was looking at how to integrate with the uh, AdWords API. And I think at the time they were using soap, which is like kind of an antiquated way of, it was just like such a pain in the butt. And, uh, and I'd spent hours and hours and hours trying to figure this out. And within, I think it was five minutes. I was like, I was like poolside with crappy internet. And within five minutes, I had done exactly what I was trying to do before with stitch and I, the, and, uh, I tried it out with Fivetran, exact same experience. Wow. And so it's like the amount of time that it will save is absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. Now I'll tell you, like, uh, 
Stitch has a connector for um, pipe drive, which is where we have all of our leads. Sorry, pipe drive's API does not allow you to uh, connect products with projects or deals. Okay. Yeah. Which is kind of weird. Um, it's, it's, I think they recognize that it's an issue and they're, I think they're working on it. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, what pipe, what uh, stitch does is just like replicates whatever the endpoints are and then just dumps all the data into your warehouse, uh, which is fantastic. But the problem is, is that I want deals with products, right? Like I want to know if this deal is associated with PPC or whether it's with analytics or creative or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, um, then that's, that required a customized solution. So now you're going from like a non-technical solution to a very technical solution. Um, that's when coding really helps out. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so what I do is it is every single day, I just go to pipe drive. I have a bunch of queries that I send to it. And um, I just download all that into Google cloud storage. And then from Google cloud storage, I load it into BigQuery. Um, okay, and this was this was you said you had set up five train Google BigQuery. What were you using for a data warehouse with Stitch? Did you have like a proprietary one? You just pay for the data, or did you have were you using BigQuery as well with Stitch? Uh, I was just using BigQuery. Um, okay. Just think about um, just think about pipe uh, not pipe drive. Uh, think about Stitch in five train as like an automated plumber, like they handle all of it for you. So if you're like, oh, I want for these five clients, I want these four metrics in these three dimensions mm -hmm. from AdWords, you just, that's, that's all you need to do. And then you just point it at a table in BigQuery yeah. and then it just starts filling in all the data. Okay. Is this similar to, have you seen a, a recently released Supermetrics release of BigQuery integration that they're now using to like bring in the data from all these different marketing platforms? I don't know, have you had a chance to see that? I did. I tried it out and uh, it didn't work. So no, I have a meeting not. tomorrow with the Supermetrics guy to do uh, the Supermetrics people to go over a demo because I have lots of questions. Yeah, that's funny. I have a demo with them at nine. Uh, good stuff. Mine's at 11. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, like I I'm just interested in it. It looks, it looks interesting. I'm not sure where, like what gap it fills in the marketplace, but it um, should be interesting to see how it works. Uh, moving on to something totally different. So I'm going to take yeah, yeah. this article because this was a funny story, man. I really love this super engaging story. So you said that you read about a guy who used machine learning to automate his dating. And you said, uh, you followed yeah. this, you followed this recipe for okay, Cupid. Can you talk a little bit about like what the end product that you built? Yeah. Like, why, yeah. why you're inspired to do this on your free time? Cause this sounds like super time intensive. Yeah, it definitely was time intensive. Um, so I was, uh, there's a Wired article about this guy who went on, I think it was like 88 dates in like two weeks. He literally would just like sit at Starbucks, like one girl would come in, he'd chat with them for 10 minutes and then he'd essentially, I think he would like tell them to leave. Uh, and then the next girl would come in. I mean, it was just like- It was like sales calls, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah, it was nuts. And then he finally said, I don't know where they are now, but, um, but he was, he was uh, getting his PhD and he was like, you know, I want to figure out this dating thing. So essentially he lived under his desk, took a break from his PhD and just focused on data mining OkCupid. And the great thing is, is that the founders of OkCupid went to Stanford and they're like total data nerds. Like one of the best books on data that I've ever read is Dataclism. Um, it's, it's the statistical analysis of all of OkCupid's data. So one of the founders is a statistician and he wrote this amazing book and it tells a lot about humanity and like and our sexual preferences and you know, it's not good or bad. It's just who we are. Right. Um, yes, Cause they, they just have so much data that they can mine. They can start making assumptions mm -hmm. about uh, our sexual characteristics as humans. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was, uh, I was like, Oh wow, that's really interesting. Um, and I've been trying to take Python courses for a while. Yeah. And, you know, figuring out how many apples that you have in your shopping cart is kind of a boring problem, right? Yeah, totally. Like, here's a list. Tell me how many apples there are in the variable name is shopping cart. And you're like, really? So like all the Code Academy courses, I did a bunch of Python courses. And I just yeah. could not get into it. Um, so I was like, you know what? I'm going to use this as an opportunity to uh, this dating thing as an opportunity to learn how to program. 
Mm. So um, I figured out what the request library was. That's how to get access to I me. Mean, you you have all these problems that you encounter, right? Like, so how do yeah. I get one person's profile? Mm -hmm. Well, you need to be logged in. Well, how do you log in? Well, there's use cookies to log in. Uh, you have a session ID and that session ID is attached to your browser and that's how you can browse through. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, well, how do I do that with programming? It's like, you know, you can use a request library. Uh, you can have, you can store your cookies in, a, I think it's called a cookie jar in, uh, in a session and you could then log in. And now that you're logged in, now you need to go to a profile. Mm -hmm. Well, um, how do you find the profile? Well, you need to have some type of search results page, just like, you know, search, uh, searching a keyword and finding out who ranks. Mm -hmm. um, you go to, like, I want to see everyone in Philadelphia. And uh, yeah, and then you just, now you have a list of all your URLs, right? Of yeah. all the profiles. So then you need to figure out what a for loop is. You need to loop through all of those. Um, so now I learned what a for loop was. Um, it'd been like so perplexing for like years. Uh, and I, it, it took me like a day to figure it out. Mm. Um, and then, you know, now that you have a list of all the URLs and now you're visiting their page, like what content do you want from that page? So now you need to use a parser, a HTML parser. I use uh, beautiful soup. Um, and so I want their, uh, I can't, I, it's been so long. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. Like, I, I want to know like, are they adventurous? Are they uh, really into food? Whatever, right? Yeah. And yeah. so then you start pulling all this data from their profile and you're like, well, now that I have all this data, I can't fit it on my computer because I want to search everyone in Philadelphia. And that yeah. takes way too long. Oh, so yeah. you're like, oh, well, I need to figure out how to get this into the cloud. All right. So I tried Amazon. Amazon was way too complex. So yeah. I went with DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean does an amazing job of catering to people like me, which is not very technical. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, all right, so now I have this thing running in the cloud. It was actually on my laptop. And yeah. so I had to go to work and I would break the internet connection. And then when I started mm -hmm. up again, I'd have to start the crawl all over again. I'm like, well, this isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. And so I'd let the crawl run overnight. And then when the crawls got too big, I would then have to put it up in the cloud. But then like, I don't want to store it on a CSV. Yeah. Right, because a CSV would just take a really long time to load, yes. and it's relational data, right? Like, I want to if I'm going to Colorado, um, and I want every, everyone in Colorado, I want to be able to instead of storing that in one giant flat file, it's going to be absolutely huge. I want to say like, oh, here are all the people in Colorado, and then here's all the profile information in two tables. Join them. It's a lot more efficient that way. And so then I need to learn SQL, right? So it's like, now I need to learn how to do a relational database. And so I learned it in uh, using SQLite, which is uh, not actually starting up a SQL server. Um, and so I learned SQL and how to like query all these people's profiles. And so then it's just like, it just kind of constantly is building and building and building on top of itself. And I was like, oh, I really want to know, like there's a lot of text here on what people like to do on a Friday night. Mm -hmm. I can't read all this. Mm -hmm. How am I going to consume all this data? I was like, well, I know that Google has a uh, natural language processing API. Why don't I just send everything through that and then get all the entities that people are talking about? Mm -hmm. And then that'll be an easier way of being able to categorize people. And then it's like, you know, I don't want to date everyone on the internet. Like, it doesn't make any sense. And so what I found out was mm -hmm. there are like a, uh, when you look at the people's interests, right? Mm -hmm. um, a person that is uh, nerdy, it tends to be more bookish or like libraries or whatever. And a person that likes uh, libraries is maybe a bit more uh, adventurous. I don't know. So you have like one, one segment and then you have another segment, which is like very religious, right? Very religious people are more conservative, more conservative people are blank, right? Like you just keep on filling it in. So what I found out by scraping, oh God, dude, it's like hundreds of thousands of profiles. I found out that like, it's actually fits, it fits the stereotypes that we have of society. Mm -hmm. Like, and so like there are all these different clusters. I use a, a network graph um, to, to look at all these different clusters of people. And so there'd be like a cluster over here and a cluster over here and they'd have different attributes and all the things that you'd assume without one attribute would be associated with, it was then associated with the other attribute that you'd be, you'd assume associated with. And I was like, yeah. cool. Now I just want to target these people in this one segment, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'd be like, all right, so how do I do that? Well, if you look on the page, 
um, they have questions, right? That's how you're matched with people. Mm-hmm. And so I was matched with like, like one or two people at 80%, right? And so what I did was I looked at how everyone in my little cluster answered questions. And if they all answered the same question the same way, it was indicative of that cluster, right? Like if you, like 100% of the people said that they weren't racist, right? Yeah. yeah. And so it's like, well, when I answer that question, I want to say I'm not racist, mm-hmm. right? Because then that means I'm going to be closer to that, that segment. Yeah, and so, um, so I programmatically answered all my questions. Uh, so then I would be matched with the segment that I was like my target audience, I guess. Uh, yeah. I'd be matched them very closely. That's interesting. And then I was like, well, I'm gonna, I mean, it's very dishonest to just like answer all these questions. I didn't know, like, <laughs> questions. And so, you know what I mean, like, it's very dishonest to answer all these questions and not actually be representative of who I am. Yeah, so I yeah. went through and I looked at all the questions I'd answered and I, uh, I was like, nope, I don't, I don't think this, I don't think this way, I don't think this way, I don't think this way. And so it was, at, it was representative of who I am, right? Yeah, yeah. And so when I rolled out this strategy, I was matched with like 99%. There were like maybe 20 people at 99% matched. When before I only had one person at like wow. 80%. Yeah. And so then I just started getting messages from people being like, oh my God, I've never been 99% matched with somebody. <laughs> you're like, I bet you haven't. Yeah, I bet you haven't. Yeah, because guess what? You're in my you're my target audience. Like, you're, my you're probably someone I'd want to get to know. Like the the inadequacies of their algorithm, mm-hmm. I had to compensate for by programmatically answering questions and understanding the uh, the target audience. And had OK Cupid done a better job, and I'm not saying that they're bad at their jobs. Like, I think they're very, very, very smart people. In my experience the way that I was honestly answering questions, I just wasn't matched with anybody. I wasn't matched with the target audience, right? Mm -hmm. But once I started programmatically answering questions with people that I wanted to meet, I started meeting those people and I had amazing conversations. Like some of them weren't like great, but I ended up dating many people uh, after that. But that's that's Um, interesting though. So is there, do you think there's actually the potential for like the serious uh, improvements to be made on the algorithms you're using for selection at a company like OKQ? Because like, when I think about it, I just assume that there's like, you know, a bunch of Stanford PhDs there and like they got their there are. algorithm yeah. officer that used to work at Facebook, you know, so I just like, I can't imagine there's all these massive gaps, but based on what you're saying, it sounds like that's, that might be the case. Well, so the thing is, is like when you, when you, all right, I'll give you another example. Um, I was trying to find, like I, uh, one of my co-workers uh talked about uh like roasting coffee beans right and i was like oh that's super hipster i would never do that and he was like oh you could just do it with a coffee maker yeah. or not a coffee maker an air popper like a popcorn popper i didn't know that and, okay yeah so you just like put green coffee unroasted coffee in a popcorn popper and it roasts the coffee for you it's absolutely amazing oh wow and, uh and so i started getting into it and i bought a roaster and i there's this place called sweet maria's um they sell a lot of, they work with like farmers around the world uh, to, um, to they, they buy all their coffee and they connect them with people that want to roast it. Mm. Amazing, amazing company. I think they're based out of uh, Portland, Oregon. And uh, I wanted to get some coffee that had like really strong berry notes. Mm-hmm. Um, I like that like, fr- like really fruity coffee. Yeah. I was on their website and there weren't any filters any good filters for, for berry. Like I went to a couple of them and like I searched for it, like there was a little button that said uh, option for fruit and I filtered and I started looking at the results and I was like, these aren't really that fruity. Like I don't understand why. Yeah, so it was like a really bad experience. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, I think I can solve this problem. Yeah. And so I, I, um, I, I went to their website and using something called Scrapey, um, like every two seconds, I would just visit another page and then another page and then another page until I have now an entire inventory of every coffee they sell with, oh, a, wow. uh, with the flavor profiles of every single one of those coffees. Yeah. And so um, I loaded that into cloud storage. From cloud storage, I then transferred it into BigQuery. And then mm-hmm. from BigQuery, I visualized it with Data Studio. So now I literally have like a dashboard of Visual. all the Victoria's <laughs> coffees. Yeah, that's and I can true. say, I want berry. And then, and then it'll, uh, there's, a, there's a map of the world. 
of where yeah. all the coffees are sourced from. And then all the countries will like light up where it's, you know, they have really like fruity <laughs> coffees. And then I, and then I have a correlation plot, you know, the, the, the rating that Sweet Maria's gives it yeah. and they press. And dude, I cannot tell you how insane it was to see this correlation plot. And there was one coffee that was like $78 a pound, right? Okay. $78 a pound. And it was rated at 92%, right? Mm -hmm. There's the highest rating that Sweet Maria gave any of their coffees. Mm -hmm. And then if you go down on the price scale, you can see there is a coffee for 628 mm -hmm. at 91.5%. Yeah, yeah. So that's like a $60 difference for half yeah. a percentage point in quality. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. of course I'm going to buy that awesome that's, coffee. That's that's really well. difference. It's like 10 times the price too. That's crazy, man. Yeah, exactly. So I was like, I have no idea why this is so expensive, Yeah. but I don't really care because this coffee is so much less expensive in the same quality. And so I just bought like a bunch of that because I, thought, I was like, I got to try this out. Like they're saying it's really great. Um, and then there was like a, you know, there's like uh filtering. So like when I clicked on a dot in the correlation plot, the entire map updated, like the, the table updated with a link to it. So I just went to that link and I could see like where it was sourced. Like, was it wet processed or I have no idea farm. There's so many like technical terms. I couldn't really make heads as tails of it. Yeah. But then I was like, Oh, here's the berry one. And then I look at the, like the top, the, the coffee with the most berry flavor mm -hmm. was like 10th on the fruity filter on their website. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, yeah. So I'm so glad that I did this instead of clicking through hundreds of coffees and trying and then yeah. like keeping them all balanced in my head. Like, oh, what was this one? What was this one? What was this one? What was this one? Instead, yeah. I just had this awesome data studio dashboard that I could just select berry and then boom, there you go. I have the most berry coffee I could possibly find from Super Marie. And I bought a bag of that. That's so intense. So it's like, the, you, I did the same thing with a modem. I'm, there's a modem right here and there's like a hundred options on Xfinity to, for finding a modem. Yeah. And it was like, oh, you just got to make sure that your Wi-Fi megabits per second doesn't, it isn't like the same. You have to make sure it's the same as what we're providing you. Mm -hmm. There's no filter for it. Yeah. And I was like, I think I can solve this problem. And I did the exact same thing with that, right? So, I mean, it took maybe a couple of hours to do it. But, like, every time I'm doing these, these small little side projects, it's because, so, OkCupid, okay Xfinity, uh, Sweet Maria's, like, because their user experiences wasn't what I wanted, um, uh, it wasn't aligned with what my use case was, I was able to use programming to uh yeah it's to to get what i needed to and so without programming i would have just been literally clicking on links all day and keeping yeah. all that stuff in my head and being like all right what's a megabit per second on this one and what is my megabits per second on wi-fi like i can't yeah. do that like i'm no, not that's that an interesting use case because that's that's so common too where people have a specific grouping of features that they they want you know for each one they want a specific thing and like looking through someone's arbitrarily made database for a store an online store is generally not going to work like you like you mentioned right? yeah that's so interesting. yeah it seems like it seems like that's something that more people would uh would have figured out by now well so it's really hard because like when you're you know i've been in the, i've been in those shoes like when you're uh you know it's good when i consult on like tech seo um it'd be like oh well, what what category should we have what should we call them i'm yeah. like uh, based on search volume this is what i would recommend um <laughs> Right, but that's not necessarily what people are looking for, and yeah, so like you try, like as a marketer, you try to do you try to make your best guess, and but you you know that you know it's a bell curve, right? I'm usually like on some end of the bell curve. I'm not like I'm I might not necessarily be in the middle. Yeah, um, yeah. and so for those people that are on the both sides, um, that's where program can really help out. Um, yeah. God, that's like so interesting. So I, you've obviously come up with all of these like very creative solutions. You, I'm surprised you want to go back and get a degree because it sounds like you're building some pretty, pretty interesting stuff already. But um, one one question, pretty technically, you might have an opinion on is how should marketers have you ever come across a way, or how do you think marketers can try to get 
uh, better attribution data, maybe combining some of these tools. I know, I know you can combine a lot of the data from different you know, ad platforms and different CRMs for your sales data or even uh, shopping carts for your sales data. Have you ever come across or thought about a way people can get better, more accurate attribution? Because, you know, attribution data is like one of the worst quality uh, metrics people are, are using right now on any of these platforms. And it's definitely right for improvement. Um, I wish I had something more for you. Like, I haven't really That's messed awesome. with attribution data. Uh, I got to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you're 100% you're right. Like, there's a lot of people working on this problem. A lot of startups with tons of money uh, are trying to solve these problems. Yeah. Um, but we, we, you know, had a great data scientist that was working on this, um, did amazing work. Um, it's just something that I really haven't come in contact with. So I have, I, yeah. I can't really tell you. Um, yeah, sorry. No, it's all good. I mean, most of the, you know, biggest platforms have not come out with a easy to implement solution. Yeah, so. yeah. It's a messy, it's, it's a messy world out there and attribution is very messy. Um, uh, but I'm sure someone's yeah. going to figure out one day. You know, you just got to wait around. Or you, you yeah. can help someone too. <laughs> I know. I, I, I know. Yeah. It's an interesting problem. Um, okay, so going back to the software. So, yeah, you mentioned that you're thinking about getting a degree. What, what's, like, your motivation to do that? Why do you want to go back? Like, what sort of things do you want to build that you can't do now? And do you, do you want to kind of start to focus more on software engineering than the, the marketing stuff? So... It's, it's, it's like the same story, right? So uh, I was yeah. like, well, if I'm a data engineer, like, you know, what happens after SEER? Um, you know, let's, let's say something happens and I'm not working in here anymore. Like, what would I do? Yeah. Um, it's a big fear of mine is like, you know, unemployment and not having a job. And so I was like, well, I'm gonna face that fear and try to figure it out, right? Um, and so I started doing some Google searches around like, you know, what qualifications did a data engineer have? And I would come into like these Reddit threads. Um, thankfully, Yahoo Answers didn't come up. I don't know if that's still around, but it probably would have. Um, you know, Quora came up and there were some really thoughtful, uh, insightful responses, but none of them were like, not everyone was saying the same thing. Yeah. And so a lot of it was contextual. Um, you know, if you're working at Uber, um, you might want to have a PhD in computer science. Um, but if you're working at a startup, it might not necessarily be that applicable. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was like, I, I need to figure, I, I need some data in order to tell me what to do here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And there, were, there wasn't any data. I couldn't find any okay. good studies on like what it would take to be a data engineer. Yeah. So I went to a, uh, a professional careers social network and uh, I looked at data engineers in various cities and uh, I looked at, you know, where did they go to school? Um, what degrees did they have? Um, where did they work? Um, yeah, what, what skills did they have? Um, mm -hmm. And I, you know, it was, it was awesome because I was using uh, Selenium and Request and Python. I, I love programming. So I was able to uh, to extract all this data and I put it into a SQL light file, uh, like a SQL database and yeah. uh, yeah. use pandas to create uh, pandas and Jupyter uh, to do, you know, an analysis of uh, all this data that I had collected. And I found out that like, yeah, I mean, it's not required to have a master's degree in computer science. Uh, yeah. However, I think it was... Uh, over 50% of people that were data engineers or at least had data in their title um, were, uh, had a master's degree. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so it's not, I mean, it's, if it was like 5%, I wouldn't really be considering it, um, but it's 50% and that number is probably going to keep on growing. And yeah. I was also like, what, because I've, ta I've taken like maybe 35 courses um, for like online courses. Wow. And, and I was like, well, am I in the minority here? And it turns out that um, data engineers take a lot of uh, courses online yeah, and they're yeah. primarily focused in machine learning. It's because, you know, if you're a data engineer and you're trying to implement a machine learning model in your data pipeline, you need to be able to communicate with data scientists. And so brushing up on your math, what linear regression is, uh, reinforcement learning, like you need to understand some of those concepts in order to have good conversations to be able to do your job. And so it's very fascinating that, um, you know, data engineers were taking majority like machine learning courses. Um, 
I had gone to Udacity for machine learning. So I had a bit of a background there. So I was like, I feel pretty confident with that. And then, um, and then it was crazy. Cause I was like, you know what? Like people probably take go like MIT, like take online courses from MIT and Stanford and, you know, but it wasn't true at all. It was Coursera. Like Coursera right. overwhelmingly was like, like so many people. And the next person was like, next online platform was like way back here. Um, so I was like, well, I'm glad that I did a lot of Coursera courses and I'm glad that I have machine learning background. Um, so I, I feel really confident with that. Um, but I just don't have that master's degree. And yeah. so I'm like, and now I'm starting to take, um, I'm starting to take uh, computer science classes um, through Coursera. Okay. Just to see if it's something that I want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, then that will hopefully make me more marketable um, in the future because I better believe that like probably more people are getting minted with uh, master's degrees every day. And so, you know, while that's a market today, I don't necessarily know what the market's going to look like in the future. Um, so to kind of future proof uh, myself, um, uh, considering that I'm not necessarily doing. It. Yeah, no, definitely. I think, I think learning and really focusing on one or one or two areas is super important. Um, I can't imagine you would ever be jobless. That seems like very far fetched to me, but uh, well, hey, I appreciate great. the compliment. <laughs> With those projects, man, those are just such such valuable projects. They're uh, you know so. Much. I appreciate um, it. Yeah, no, definitely, man. I uh, I mean, you did great work. That article was awesome. But um, so if people are wanting to get into this, um, and this is like my last question, Thomas. If people are wanting to get into this get into data engineering. And let's say, for example, they're starting from where you're at. They're maybe in marketing, Jason started performance marketing. Uh, what would you suggest they start with? Like what you know, two or three technologies would you suggest they just go get a course and get their feet wet with data engineering? So um, based on my analysis of data engineers, if they want to do data engineering, um, Python and SQL are mandatory, pretty much. Um, and then Java is good to have. R is like if you really want to tinker with it. Um, so Python would probably be the language of choice. I really like Python because um, I programmed in JavaScript and PHP uh, before, um, and it was very hard to learn from them. Um, but I, I feel like Python is very good if you're trying to start learning how to program. Uh, and it's also great for backend, like if you're trying to extract data. I mean, I have, um, I have Python running on a Raspberry Pi that's trying to tell me with the like when the best time to park out front of my apartment. Oh yeah, I remember this one, yeah. Yeah, so like it's, um, it's so applicable. You can have Python turn on and off your lights. Uh, you could have Python, uh, you know, completely in, in your back end. Um, you can use Django, which is a Python web framework, which is fantastic. So I'd recommend doing Python. It's probably gonna be the most versatile. Um, a lot of people are like, oh, I'm going to learn JavaScript. And it's like, well, are you going to be a front-end developer? Um, yeah. no, 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 I just want to extract data. It's like, mm, probably not the best idea. Cool. Um, yeah. You can do it. You, know, you could use Node to get up a web server, and it could be doing all these great things. But it's probably not the direction that you want to go in. Yeah. Um, so I would say, you know, take a – actually, don't take a Python course. Um, <clears throat> I'd recommend people don't take a course to begin with. Uh, begin with a problem. Right, like, oh, I want to get data, and have it be an easy problem, right? Like, I want to get data from this website. Like, probably the easiest problem that you can have, right? And a lot of a lot of us have that problem. It could be like trying to find a router or the best coffee bean to to buy. You have some type of problem that you're coming in contact with, uh, just like with me with uh, with OK Cupid. Like, yeah, it's super creepy that I was like extracting all this data and. <laughs> optimize images and uh, entities on my profile. Like, believe it or not, yeah, everyone does love Netflix. Um, big surprise, that's what I like to do yeah. it on Friday night. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so there's like, um, start with a problem and, and, and just try to solve that one problem, like a very simple problem, like getting data from a web page. If you start with that one problem, you're gonna learn what a for loop is probably, you're probably gonna learn what a request library is, probably gonna learn uh, you know, how to parse HTML, like, the, and you're going to, in that pursuit, you're going to also learn what a method on a class is, you're going to learn um, what a variable is, is so many things that you're going to come in contact with, that you might not necessarily understand what they are. But you better believe that there are many people like you out there that are trying to do the exact same thing. And thankfully, all of their questions are answered. <laughs> 
Yeah. And I mean, it might not necessarily be like, oh, how do I, how do I scrape every single page on Amazon? Like hard problem. Don't start with that. <laughs> like, yeah. how, like, don't do that. It's like, uh, you know, I, I want to get the best coffee bean. How do, how do I extract the data from this uh, web page? Mm -hmm. Those are very easy problems. And what will end up happening is when you, when you start with that problem, you'll come, you're just going to constantly be Googling, 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 and then take a Python course. And you'll be like, Oh, a list. I know what a list is like a, a tuple or a tuple. Like, yeah, I know what that is. Like I know that's an immutable. And then, and then everything just starts clicking and then you're like, Oh my God, I got this. And then yeah. that will give you confidence to keep on going. Right. You um, have that context for all this the potential exactly. looks like random stuff you're learning. Yeah, like figuring out how many bananas are in your car is a really bad problem to have, you know, solve. Yeah. But like, how do I find awesome dates is like a way better problem. Yeah. Uh, and something that I care about. Mm -hmm. And um, and I will do, like I've taken a lot of online courses, uh, especially for Python. Um, I would recommend um, Pluralsight. Um, I, like I'm not affiliated with them at all. Um, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just tell you, like they're very nice because um, there are very few online platforms that will go deep. Um, they get into like byte arrays and um, encoding and like really, really, really deep uh, Python stuff. Um, mm -hmm. That was insanely valuable for me to learn for like the next stage in my career. Yeah. Like, yeah. I got all the simple stuff out of the way and now I'm like, oh, well, I want to... I want to learn about design patterns and like the best and the most efficient way of coding. Mm -hmm. um, I would highly recommend all plural site after you've done like the hard work of learning how like to extract data from a website or whatever problem you're trying to solve. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I'll have to check it out because I've, I've heard them recommended a lot, but I still have yet to, to check out a plural site course. <laughs> I yeah. will have to do that. Um, but Ethan, I want to thank you for coming on. I'm going to cut it and we can chat after, but I really appreciate you taking that. Of course. Share some of your knowledge with people. Dude, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it.